Good morning, everyone. Great to see you. Thanks for being here. I, uh, I like the people in the second section getting an update on VR and AR and a good suntan at the same time. That's cool. Good, good job. Um, so uh, hopefully you caught the news yesterday uh, in the main keynote. Great momentum with apps on Daydream, more Daydream-ready phones on the way, standalone VR headsets with inside-out positional tracking, uh, a super precise indoor location service we call VPS, uh, and then an update to Expeditions that we're really excited about. So I'm going to be brief here, and in a minute we'll turn it over to the people on our team who are actually leading many of the projects you're going to hear about today. But before I do that, I wanted to put what we're doing in VR and AR at Google in context, kind of put some of the puzzle pieces together for you so that you can better understand why we're doing what we're doing, and as developers, what you can expect from us. So if you've followed what we've been up to over the past several years, you've seen a bunch of different pieces. Uh, cardboard, Daydream, Tango, Jump, uh, VR apps like Earth and Tilt Brush. We're working in VR. We're doing some work in AR. Like, What's going on here? How do, you, how do you think about this? So first of all, terminology. Over the past year especially, I've seen so many debates about VR versus AR. Which is going to win? Like, What vocab to use? And to us, these terms don't represent two separate and distinct things. They're just labels for different points on a spectrum. And for lack of a better name, we call that the spectrum of immersive computing. Kind of fully immersive is at the right. That's where everything's computer generated. That's virtual reality. And uh, real reality, like this, is at the left end of the spectrum. Uh, and AR and whatever other terms you want to use are somewhere in the middle. What's important to us is not the specific labels, uh, but it's this whole spectrum. And we're doing work across it. But why? Why invest in this? Why is it important? Well, VR, AR, immersive computing, these technologies matter because they enable us to experience computing more like we experience the real world. They enable computing to work more like we do. And we think that's a big idea. We think that's really important because every time computers have started to work, like more, work more like we do, good things have happened. Like if you think about moving from punch cards to the command line to the GUI to touch screens, with every progression, we became more able, more capable with our computers. And we think VR and AR will push this even further. They open up access to an entirely new kind of information, kind of experiential information, or information that's anchored physically to the real world. And we think this progression is going to be powerful. And in time, it's going to change how we work and play and live and learn. And we want to help push this forward in two ways. So first, platforms. Just as Chrome made the web faster, more secure, more powerful, and as Android made mobile computing more widely available, we hope that platforms like Daydream can push forward VR and other te technologies. And our goal here is really to raise all boats by doing a lot of the heavy lifting in the core system software, device standards, reference hardware, and SDKs. And the second part is building blocks. And by these, I mean the enabling technologies like Tango, WebVR, our Jump VR video capture system, code samples, and more. And we also think of the apps we've built, like Tilt Brush or Earth VR or Expeditions as building blocks and that they're kind of early examples of VR apps to look at and to learn from. So this morning is about exactly these two things, platforms and building blocks. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Johnny Lee, the founder of the Tango Project, to talk about one of our most important building blocks. Thanks. Howdy, howdy. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, my name is Johnny Lee. I'm the engineering director of Tango. In 2013, a small group of us uh, got together with the belief that one day our devices would be able to sense 3D motion and space just like we can. And so with the right combination of hardware and software, Tango can give our devices this 3D sense of motion sensing capabilities, as well as the ability to recognize places it's been before. And so this establishes a, a shared space, a shared sense of space and physical movement between people and our devices. And it allowed us to begin creating experiences that uh, gave us an early glimpse into how we could interact with digital content in a physical way. 
Today, four years later, we're starting to see a new genre of products in both AR and VR that put 3D tracking, uh, a sense, 3D tracking and sensing as a fundamental part of the user experience. And so Tango is involved into an enabling technology that's uh, do it, powering everything we're doing within Daydream. Yesterday, you heard Clay talk about our support for standalone VR headsets. And by building all the hardware into the headset and taking advantage of years of optimization work with Qualcomm uh, uh, mobile processors, low-cost tracking sensors, we can enable a headset that responds to the movement of the user's head, similar to desktop VR systems we see today, but without all the cables and setup. And we call this technology WorldSense. And it's a version of Tango that we've been working on specifically for VR. So let me show you a little bit about how it works in a headset. There's two wide-angle cameras that detect the movement of features in the room. And these features might be things like the corners of a desk, uh, items on the table, or texture on the floor. And it tracks the movement of these features over time to get a sense of its position in the room. We then tightly couple this visual motion information with the motion sensors in the phone to provide robust low-latency positional tracking. And we give this information to games and applications all in less than five milliseconds, achieving an overall display latency of around 20 milliseconds. At the same time, the system is building a coarse 3D model of a scene, uh, recognizing features that's seen before, so it can correct any drift that may occur over time. Uh, you may have heard this referred to as SLAM, or simultaneous localization and mapping. So that's a high-level review of what WorldSense is and eliminates one of the major differences between desktop and mobile VR today. Now, in smartphone AR, uh, AR applications require sensing even more of the environment uh, to be able to place digital objects in front of us accurately enough to seem as though they physically exist. And today, today, Tango phones use additional sensors to enable a richer set of augmented reality experiences than is possible with a standard phone. We have a dedicated depth sensor that allows games to understand the difference between the floor, the table, and the walls, and even lets characters hide behind things like couches. We have a wide-angle camera track for tracking that gives us the best view of the features in the room, uh, allowing very robust positional tracking of the phone. And this and it also improves our ability to quickly relocalize so we can recognize where we are in the room, letting you see AR content that was set there before or even left by other people. And so to give you an example of the kind of experiences that you can do with all of this technology put together, I wanted to share you, you, with you this project that we've been doing with the uh, Singapore Art Science Museum. You have audio for the video? Most people living in cities have never been to a rainforest. Ah, no audio so we decided to oh, bring a rainforest to a city and make it accessible for everyone. For that, we needed a new Google technology. We were able to map 10,000 square feet of a museum space into a rainforest. Visitors experience what it's like to walk through a rainforest, learned about endangered animals threatened by deforestation, and were tasked to plant a virtual tree. We were able to launch this experience on the first Tango-enabled device, the Lenovo Fab2 Pro, and bring AR at scale to everyone, making Into the Wild the largest AR experience in the world. So sorry about missing the, oh, yeah, yeah thanks. Uh, so the exhibit actually allows thousands of visitors to come and experience a digital rainforest in it. And when they pledge a donation to the World Wildlife Fund, they actually are allowed to plant a tree. And other visitors can see that tree grow in the museum. And the rainforest starts to expand over time as visitors uh, see the exhibit. We're still in the early days of seeing how these experiences will evolve. Uh, so let me just, this is just a glimpse into what's possible today. The first phone featuring Tango enabled capabilities was the Lenovo Fab2 Pro, which had shelves last fall. Our second phone is the Zenfone AR from Asus. And I'm really glad to announce that customers will be able to experience the Zenfone in Verizon stores across the United States uh, later this summer. And over the next year, you'll see us bring Tango functionality to many, many more phones. And we really just believe this is the beginning. We've seen a variety of great applications begin to appear that take advantage of these new, new capabilities. For example, we have tools that can help you measure the size of the table, 
uh, in case you're interested in buying one for your dining room. Uh, or you can do things like walk around your house uh, with the tracking sensors and the, motion and the depth sensor to generate a heat map of the Wi-Fi wi wi signal strength within your apartment or in the building. And this actually lets you help find, you, help, help find dead spots or where you might want to put the router or even buy a repeater. Uh, you can even use a, a estimate the square footage of your apartment, uh, which might actually come in handy if you're thinking about moving into a new place or even renegotiating your rent. There's games like World by Phenomena, which allow you to carry a toy box right in your pocket. And yesterday, you heard about the visual positioning service from Clay, which opens up many new experiences around indoor uh, location and navigation. With the permission of each venue, we use the wide-angle camera and the Tango phone to give us a broad view of the environment. And this allows us to generate large-scale descriptions of the space. And this enables centimeter-scale accurate positioning within the building. It's a lot like GPS, but rather than talking to satellites you know, 1,000 miles above the Earth, uh, it's just using features that are just a few feet away to calculate its position. This is what we actually use in the Art Science Museum that allows us to anchor trees in the environment. In stores like retail, in stores like Lowe's, uh, it can get you walking directions directly to an item sitting on the shelf. We're still in the early days of uh, what we feel like will be possible with these technologies. And it lets us see things in new ways that we couldn't see before. Uh, so it helps us learn about more about the environment. It helps us find our way through spaces uh, and share knowledge with other people in a physical and visual medium. But one of the things that helps, it helps us do is learn better, especially when we are able to make connections with those who are seeing the same thing at the same time from their own unique perspective. And in this way, the power of AR isn't in just adding digital objects to the camera view in front of us, but it can be shared, uh, adding shared meaning to the interaction between people. So to tell you more about how shared AR experiences can help in the classroom, let me hand it off to Jen Holland. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Johnny. I'm Jennifer Holland, and I'm the Education Program Manager on Daydream. Johnny shared some updates about the applications of Tango, as well as areas where we think AR can have a big, immediate impact. Education is just one of those areas, and my team took advantage of Tango's sensor stack and built a tool for schools so that teachers could create immersive experiences with their students. And that's the same technology that's actually available to all of you. Two years ago, we launched Expeditions VR. And we've built more than 600 tours, and we've heard from thousands of kids from around the world who have sent us personal letters sharing how Expeditions has inspired them. We've learned a great deal from talking to the over 2 million teachers and students who have actually used it. And one of the most important things that my team learned was that you really need to embrace the key functions of a classroom. That is, students engaging, interacting, and learning with each other, as well as their teacher. Tango's camera and sensor are what makes this interaction possible in real time. And no, I promise you, those kids are not taking selfies in their class. Teachers are able to accurately map the physical classroom and place 3D objects like one of Michelangelo's statues right on the students' desks so that all students can look at the statue together in real time. Students can move the Tango-enabled phone to get up close to see the detail or take a step back to get a sense of the scale and be able to point out new discoveries on the statue together. And that's powerful, because it's not each individual student looking at their own object like a whirling Category 5 hurricane. It's as if you actually brought the hurricane into the classroom. Students can view any object from a strand of DNA to one of Saturn's rings together. And those objects don't disappear when the students look away. And a teacher is able to point out specific things on the object to suit the lesson. Just think how cool it would be for a teacher to transform their entire classroom into a world-class art museum and display the works of Van Gogh, Monet, or even the Mona Lisa right on the same classroom walls. 
As an education product team, we're committed to leveraging the same Tango technology available to you and tweaking it slightly to give teachers a tool to create immersive experiences each and every day in their classroom. And just like we did with Expeditions VR, we're going to be bringing this tool to schools through the AR Expeditions Pioneer program. And schools can sign up if they're interested for a visit. And if you're a developer really excited about building AR lessons with us, let us know by expressing interest on our partner page. That's Expeditions AR. That is just one thing that you can do with Tango, and we're really excited to see what all of you come up with. Now, let's switch gears and talk about another part of the immersive computing spectrum. Let me welcome Mike to tell you the latest about Daydream, our platform for high-performance mobile VR. Great job. Man. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Mike Jazieri, and I'm the Director of Product Management for Daydream. Daydream serves as the foundation of our investments in immersive computing. We began working on Daydream in 2015 with the initial goal of bringing high-performance smartphone VR to Android. Today, I'm excited to tell you about what's next for Daydream. But first, a quick refresher on how we got here. So the first version of Daydream launched in November and was built on three core elements. The Daydream Ready spec for phones, a high-performance VR mode in Android N, and of course, the Daydream experience, including Play Store in VR. We promised to create a large ecosystem of Daydream Ready devices. And I'm very proud to say that in just six months, there are eight Daydream Ready devices on market. And as Clay announced yesterday, Samsung's flagship S8 and S8 Plus will soon be Daydream Ready, with an update coming this summer. They're fantastic phones, and you're going to love the Daydream experience on them. But that's not all. LG's next flagship phone, launching in the second half of this year, will also be Daydream Ready. In addition to these new partners, existing partners, including Motorola and Asus, will have more Daydream Ready phones. So when you put all that together, there will be tens of millions of Daydream Ready phones in consumers' hands by the end of the year. I think that's a really big deal, and I want to thank our partners uh, who've been working really hard on that. Thank you. So that's the start. Now let's talk about what's coming next. This year at Google I.O., we're announcing two major updates to Daydream. The first is support for a brand new category of standalone headsets. And second is a major update to the Daydream software platform. We're going to call this 2.0 release Daydream Euphrates. Let's talk about both, and let's start with headsets. So as Clay announced yesterday, the standalone headset takes everything that we love about smartphone VR and makes it even better. All you need for VR, the software, the hardware, is in one integrated device. It's much more immersive because of WorldSense. And you can get into VR in just seconds. You just put the headset on, you're ready to go. No extra wires, PCs, or setup required. Now, for these standalone headsets, we wanted to create a large ecosystem of devices and of content. And doing so requires great hardware. So we've partnered deeply with Qualcomm to create a reference standalone headset. This is featuring this powerful Snapdragon 835 chipset, custom designed tracking cameras, and high performance sensors. Now, those tracking cameras are particularly important because they enable a much more immersive VR experience with WorldSense, which Johnny just talked about. But a reference headset isn't all that we're doing. We're also partnering with two leading device makers to actually bring these headsets to market starting at the end of the year. HTC really needs no introduction uh, in the world of VR. They're already a leader in this space with the Vive headset. They're going to bring their expertise in headset design, optics, and building high-performance VR systems to Daydream. Our other partner is Lenovo. And we've worked, they've been a longtime partner of ours, and we worked together to bring this first Tango phone to market. So they're already a pioneer in AR, and they're going to bring that same pioneering spirit to Daydream. So that's standalone headsets. But powerful hardware also requires powerful software. And that's where the next version of Daydream, Daydream Euphrates, comes in. We focused on three things for this release. First is all the software support you need for standalone headsets. Second is making VR content front and center, the content that you build. And third is making it easy for users to share that VR content with friends and family, whether they're sitting right next to them or around the world. So let's talk about each one. Daydream Euphrates takes advantage of even deeper support for VR that's in Android O, in particular the capabilities needed to support standalone headsets. 
So if you think about it, Android phones have been designed for device, or Android has been designed for devices that primarily run uh, touch screens. But a standalone headset, by definition, has no touch screen. So we've had to build a new VR window manager deep into Android so that we have an operating system where all the system UI will be accessible in VR. Also with Daydream Euphrates, we're updating the Daydream home experience for both smartphones and standalone headsets. First, we're going to make it easy to discover the best content in VR. You'll see a curated list of continuously updated stream of content with thematic collections mixing together thousands of videos, experience, games, and apps. Now, once you're in the VR experience, we don't want to break that sense of immersion. So Daydream Euphrates also has a new dashboard that embraces the immersive nature of VR and appears right on top of any app. It's super fast to load and lets you stay in VR. You won't have to leave the experience to check a notification, change settings, or even to switch apps. So now that we've made it easy to stay in VR, we want to help you share that experience with others, even if they're not wearing a VR headset. So today, I'm excited to announce cast support is coming to Daydream. With this feature, thank you, thank you. It's one of our top requested features. So with this feature, uh, you'll be able to pull up the dashboard and simply select a casting destination. As you go from app to app, your cast station stays. Now casting, what I love about it is it changes the VR experience from an individual experience to a shared experience and really brings your friends and family into the fun with you. Now casting is good for people who are physically near you, but what about everyone else? To help you share your favorite moments in VR, we're also adding the ability to capture a screenshot or a short video of your daydream experience and share it on your favorite social media or messaging app. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so that's a quick look at what's coming with Daydream Euphrates. In addition to this, there's many, many other features, including many for developers. Um, and you can learn more about that in our other sessions or obviously on our developer website. To sum it all up, we've got tens of millions of Daydream Ready phones by the end of the year, a new class of standalone VR headsets, and a brand new update to the Daydream software we call Euphrates that's coming later this year for both smartphone VR and for standalone headsets. So finally, I spoke a little bit ago about making it easier to share your VR experience with others. We think this is really critical for users to keep them engaged, and also where perhaps some of the most innovative experiences will come. So let me welcome Aaron from the YouTube VR team, who's going to tell you about some of the things YouTube VR is doing to make shared experiences a reality. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Aaron. I'm a product manager from the VR team at YouTube. We made an early bet on 360 degree and 3D video and thought a lot about how to build the YouTube VR app from the ground up for Daydream. It does everything you love about YouTube, but in a way that feels natural in a virtual world. Since we launched, people's responses have blown us away. Every time I pop in, there's something new to explore, from sports highlights to historic landmarks, deep sea dives to learning about dinosaurs. No matter what you're passionate about, YouTube in VR can take you there thanks to the huge library of hundreds of thousands of immersive videos. So there are all these amazing places you can go, see, and learn about. You probably want to share these experiences with other people. It's just better that way. From co-watching parties to creators engaging with their fans, YouTube already has an incredible community that's built around its content. And we want to bring that to VR. So here's a sneak peek into something that we're working on. Later this year, we'll be rolling out an update that lets you co-watch YouTube videos with other people, talk about them live, and share the experience all in the same virtual room. Everyone will be able to customize the way that they look in VR. And with just a click, you can sync in to watch what others are watching too. For example, Anyone can connect with other Gorillaz fans to watch their latest music video in a virtual front row. For me, VR video goes well beyond games, entertainment, and music. So many creators, like this one, use VR to inspire empathy and compassion. In fact, there is no other technology that lets you walk in someone else's shoes, experience things that you can't in real life, and gain a new perspective on important topics. 
With this update to YouTube VR and the addition of casting and capture to Daydream, which Mike announced, there will soon be more ways for you to enjoy VR together. Now, let me pass this off to Andre, who's going to talk to you a bit about tools for VR and AR developers. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Andre. I lead apps and developer tools at Daydream. Hey, so much exciting progress on AR and VR platform side. But of course, platforms are defined by the best experiences available on them, experiences built by developers like you. To build great stuff, you need great tools. So today, I want to tell you about three new tools we developed to help you iterate faster, push the limits of mobile graphics, and bring you immersive experiences to the whole web. First of all, let's talk about iteration time. It's early days of immersive computing, so it's all about experimenting. You need to be able to try many new ideas as quickly as possible. And to evaluate VR content, you really need to experience it firsthand in the target hardware. But we know from many mobile developers, it might take minutes from when you make a change in the editor to when you see the result on device. We timed it. I mean, it takes three minutes sometimes, but maybe five or seven for a larger project. I can hit build, go toast myself a bagel, and come back before it's done deploying. So we knew we had to take the iteration time down from minutes to seconds. And that is why we built Instant Preview. This is a tool that lets you make changes in your desktop and instantly see them in your VR device. Thank you. <laughs> Instant Preview is deeply integrated in both the editor and the mobile device. We send the sensor data from headset and the controller to the PC, which emulates and renders the scene. And the result is sent back to the device as a stereo video stream. And the cool thing is that we can do it with low latency so that you can comfortably use it in VR while tweaking interactions in real time. The result is a continuous, uninterrupted development flow. Instant Preview. Instant Preview is launching today for both Unity and Unreal. You can download it right now. Check it out. Now, now let's talk about graphics. VR makes you feel like you're somewhere else. So the visual fidelity of the virtual environment matters a lot. And of course, with six degree of freedom devices, you just can't get away by wrapping a 360 panorama as a background. You have to render a full 3D scene. However, what you can render in real time depends on the amount of power you have available. There's a huge gap between what you can do on a 4-watt mobile device, 400-watt PC, or say a 4,000 node render farm. But what if we could bridge this gap? What if we could achieve desktop-level graphics on a mobile VR headset like our standalone? We can't change laws of physics, of course, but we can be very clever. I want to introduce a new tool we call Seurat, after the great French painter. With this tool, you can take a high-fidelity scene, like one from PC game, and run it in mobile VR in real time. How does this work? As a developer, you define a volume within which you want the user to move around and view your scene. You also define target parameters like number of polygons and overdraw. And then you let the tool do its magic. It takes dozens of images from different parts of this defined volume. And then it automatically generates an entirely new 3D scene that looks identical to the original, but is dramatically simplified. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And you still can have dynamic interactive elements in it. So yeah, it's pretty cool. But wait a minute. If we can do something like this, why would you stop at desktop level graphics? What if you take a scene so complex it can't possibly run in real time, even on the most powerful PC, like something from a movie? Let me show you a project we worked on with ILM X Lab the branch of Lucasfilm that is focused on pioneering next generation immersive experiences. One of their goals is to bring you inside of Star Wars. Let's see what they've been able to do with Syrah. 
Let's roll the video. Labs mission is really to create immersive premium story-based entertainment experiences and our goal is for people to step inside the worlds of our stories and in this case into the world of Star Wars. When there are events, uh, locations, characters, something that has to be fabricated, they turn to visual effects to create that imagery. The depth of the world that we would like you to step into is as uh, thoughtful and uh, creative and exacting as anything we might put in our films. This new technology from Google is enabling us to do something we've been trying to find for a while. We take high quality cinematic renders and we can turn them into something that's real time consumable. When XLab was approached by Google, they said that they could take our ILM renders and make them run in real time on a VR phone. Turns out it's true. You can have um, very dense, complex scenes with very sophisticated shading that uh, traditionally can't run in real time on an engine. When I see people in our demo looking at the floor and going on their hands and knees down to expect the curvature of every little bend and twist, I really think we're onto something. Uh, that potentially opens the door to, you know, cinematic realism in VR. So ILM X Lab brought this cinema quality world of Rogue One onto our mobile VR headset. I mean, this scene is around 50 million triangles and three gigabytes of textures. Normally, each frame here takes an hour to render offline on a high-performance machine. However, after processing with Surah, it now takes 13 milliseconds per frame on a mobile GPU. We reduced the texture size by a factor of 300 and the number of polygons by a factor of 1,000. Now it's comfortably running in real time on our standalone VR headset with six degrees of freedom. And it looks as good as the original. How cool is that? Well, with this technology, you, you as a developer will be able to build visually stunning experiences while still targeting mobile VR hardware. Serato already supports Unity, Unreal, and Maya. And we are currently experimenting with a smaller set of partners. We'll start rolling out the tool more broadly later this year. So please stay tuned. All right, now um, let's talk about the world's largest developer ecosystem, the web. Three years ago, we co-authored Web VR Spec. It allowed developers to build immersive 3D applications with JavaScript and WebGL and run them in the browser. This way, you're leveraging the strength of the web itself. Your code is standards-based, it adapts to different kinds of devices, and it's easy to distribute it with a link. Now imagine you're a user in a VR headset. Where do you go to discover a web VR experience? How do you serve the web in VR? Well, I'm excited to announce we're bringing the full Chrome browser in VR. Let me show you a preview. You'll be able to use Daydream Controller to navigate any regular web page and follow links. And for web VR experiences, you just get transported into fully immersive worlds. And of course, you'll be able to watch any web video in a theater-like environment with a large screen. What I love about Chrome and VR is that it's the same app I'm using for browsing in 2D, which means all of my bookmarks, history, and tabs are already there. I, I don't have to re-log into my favorite websites in VR. Things just work. Browsing in VR feels great, and it's coming to Chrome for Android later this year. But web is not only for virtual reality. We actually see big potential in the context of augmented reality, too. You see, web connects world's information. And AR connects information with the physical world. So together, they can be applied for solving real-life problems. I want to show you what AR features in the browser could look like. Let's say you're searching for a new coffee table. You're probably browsing online stores, and you're looking at some pictures on your phone. But you don't really want pictures on the phone. You want the furniture in your room. 
This is one example where connecting physical world and information would be very handy. With AR-enabled browser, your favorite website could ask you to mark the physical space you have available, and then it would only show you the items that fit in this area. And of course, you'll be able to preview search results in the context of your actual room from any angle. And you know what's cool? Thank you. You know what's cool? You, you didn't have to install a new app just for that. I mean, everything you see here is, is built with JavaScript and WebGL, and it's running in our experimental browser. So with WebVR, we will enable, to easily, uh, enable developers to easily integrate AR features into your existing websites. Just like we did with WebVR, we're starting by releasing an experimental build of Chromium, which exposes AR features like positional and depth data. It's available today. You can download it from GitHub. And we're excited to see what the community does with it. Our goal is to make WebVR and WebAR first-class citizens in all browsers. And that is it for developer tools. Thanks so much for spending some of your morning with us. We we'll look forward to partnering with you, making sure you have both the platforms and the tools to bring your next great idea to life. Make sure you check out our other talks and come over to Tango Booth to check out the demo. Thank you very much.